Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of the GIC's uh, annual public information sessions for 2022. Thank you all for joining us. We're looking forward to sharing some important information with you about this year's annual enrollment, the upcoming procurement for the health benefit and our health insurance carriers, as well as some other uh, useful information and resources for you all. I do wanna note that we have uh, CART services available for this evening's session, and a link will be posted in the chat function for access to those services. We are also recording these information sessions, which will be available on the GIC's YouTube channel. So to start, I want to uh, quickly review the agenda. Next slide. So first we will review some of the basics about the GIC as a refresher for longtime GIC members and an introduction for any new members who have joined us. We'll then move on to health insurance premium rates, which I'm sure you're eager to hear about, uh, where we will briefly explain, explain our process and the timeline and uh, what we anticipate those rates will look like for the upcoming year. Next, we'll discuss uh, the one proposed uh, change to our health insurance plan design for the coming year, and then transition to a review of the upcoming health benefit procurement, as I mentioned. Uh, the presentation portion will wrap up with an overview of uh, retirement and Medicare from GIC's Director of Operations, Paul Murphy, and we'll then open it up for questions from participants. Uh, next slide. So with regard to questions during the presentation, you may submit them at any time during the presentation via the Zoom Q&A function. We have members of the GIC staff on hand to answer some of those questions directly in writing uh, in the Q&A function. Uh, as we did last year, some of the questions that we receive um, that we think will be of uh, general interest, we will answer live for the benefit of all attendees. So if you have a question that is personal and specific in nature, please utilize the contact form noted in the yellow box at the bottom of this slide. A member of the GIC staff will follow up with you directly after the information session. So we will not be responding here today to questions about uh, those personal health coverage questions in order to maintain your privacy. So before we jump into the GIC overview, I wanna note at the outset, uh, the dates of this year's annual enrollment, as these dates are really the context of much of what we will discuss here this evening. So this year's annual enrollment will open on April 6th and close on May 4th. And now we'll move into a brief overview of the GIC to give you kind of a high level high level understanding um, of, of what we do at the GIC. So first we will start with the GIC's mission, which of course is to provide its members high quality and affordable benefits while driving improved health for members and higher value care delivery across the Commonwealth. So here just note that members and high quality affordable benefits, because they're bolded here, these are really front and center of how we how we operate and uh, what we're focused on. So as many of you know, the GIC aims to meet this mission through its coverage offerings, which include a wide array of options, including healthcare, dental, vision, life insurance, and long-term disability insurance. So the next slide uh, notes our current health insurance carriers and pharmacy benefit managers. You are all likely very well aware of these. Not shown in the slide here are the carriers for our ancillary benefits, such as MetLife for dental coverage, Davis Vision, and benefit strategies that handles our flexible spending account. So on the next slide, we just want to highlight some key data points about the GIC, including the fact that we're now over 460,000 members across the Commonwealth. We are governed by a 17-member independent commission. 
Um, you'll see the specific members and the entities that they represent here on the slide. And um, the green box highlights our annual budget um, of uh, just north of $2.3 billion. The vast majority of that, of course, is um, the claims uh, that we pay on our members' behalf. And you know, we have a wide variety of other public ent entities, agencies, municipalities, and regional schools with which we work. So regarding the GIC's budget, um, this is a chart that's sort of a visual representation of, of how we're funded. Um, as you can see, the largest piece of the GIC's funding comes directly from the Commonwealth's uh, general fund uh, from the state budget shown in blue followed by premium contributions coming from our municipalities shown in green. And of course, our members uh, yourselves through premium payments um, are responsible for the share shown in purple. So noting from the previous slide um, that uh, the Commonwealth contributes the majority of GIC funding, this slide explains a little bit about how that funding is put to work. So the Commonwealth, uh, the GIC, the Commonwealth really is the self-insured employer and the GIC administers that benefit. So this means that the Commonwealth uh, pays the employer share of medical claims, regardless of how much uh, the Commonwealth have, has budgeted for those claims. Uh, so it's really the state that holds insurance risk for the GIC not our health insurance plans. So what that means is that if medical claims in a given year exceed what the state has budgeted, um, it is actually the state that will pay those claims and it, and it really doesn't impact um, you, our members. So the three boxes at the bottom of the slide here are attempted to sort of capture how claims are actually paid. As a member, you receive your healthcare services from your provider, and it is your, your doctor or your hospital that actually sends a claim to one of our six insurance carriers. The carrier, um, which essentially acts as an administrator for the GIC, pays the provider for that claim and then bills the group insurance commission. Um, we then at the GIC reimburse our health insurance carriers for those claims. So a little sense of how this works um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, um, just before we move into the health insurance premium rates, just a reminder that you can submit questions using the Zoom Q&A function at any time. And as I noted, some of those questions we will pull out and address um, verbally for the benefit of all attendees. And again, if you have a question or an, in, or an inquiry that is personal and specific in nature, please use the contact uh, form noted in the green box. We wanna make sure that we protect your privacy here in a public session. So next we'll dive into the health insurance premium rate development. So, um, at the next slide, we'll have the timeline that um, illustrates that, um, that the GIC, you know, this is the timeline that we use and operate by every year when we develop rates. As you can see, we had our initial uh, discussion with our commission about preliminary rates at our uh, December 16th meeting. And that was followed by a meeting last week where we presented the proposed plan design changes that we'll talk about in a moment, as well as the um, financial impact of those changes. Both of these meetings are available on the GIC's YouTube page. So if you're interested in reviewing those presentations uh, and discussions, I would direct your attention there. Um, at our next meeting uh, of the commission on February 10th, Commission will vote on the proposed plan design changes that we will discuss here today, and then finally vote on your insurance premiums at their March 3rd meeting. So on the next slide, you know, we, 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 we note here preliminary rates that I referred to prior. These are for the purposes of the meeting we held on the 16th. That means the rates um, as they would be if there were no changes to any plan designs, any changes to our carriers, our funding, or, or different enrollment and different plans. Those are a number of variables that 
um, we don't expect to see changes in uh, with the exception of the plan design change. So this expected aggregate increase is the average across all of our plans, both Medicare and non-Medicare. Um, it is important to note that, um, uh, that the federal government um, does make changes to um, Medicare plans. Um, so that is sort of irrespective of what the GIC notes. Uh, any decisions that we make. Um, and I also want to note that specific plans, um, uh, the, the premium for specific plans will vary within, um, within that average. So some will have um, increases that are above the aggregate increase of 5.8%. Some will have it below. And some of them may actually fall outside of the range here. So the range really is is our average rate. This is a, a possible average range of rate increases, um, but different plans will vary. On to the next slide, please. So with that, we will um, move on to review some of the important changes um, that are happening in the insurance market that affect GIC plan offerings and the plan design changes that um, we will be proposing next week um for a vote uh next week uh at the commission meeting next week so um one of the gic plans um one of our health plans fallon health as you all may have heard announced uh last year that they will be exiting the commercial health insurance market to focus on their mass health line of business uh, so i want to make clear that this is um a business decision that was made by fallon health um, so uh, the plans that they have offered for the last uh, four years to the GIC will not be available um, for the, for, uh, during the coming annual enrollment. Uh, Fallon has been a longtime partner of the GIC and we are sorry to go, but as a result of that decision, uh, both the Fallon Select and Fallon Direct products will no longer be available to our members this coming year. Um, so any of you that are currently enrolled in these Fallon plans must enroll in a new insurance product uh, during the coming annual enrollment, which will again run from April 6th through May 4th. But what I wanna emphasize here is this is not a decision that we have made. This is a decision that uh, Fallon Health has made. Um, so members who um, fail to actively take the step to enroll in a new plan, um, if you're in a Fallon plan, will default to um, the Unicare Plus plan. So it's important to note that, um, um, and for for an individual who's going from one of the Fallon plans, um, if you're in the Fallon Select plan and you uh, fail to act and are default enrolled in the Unicare Plus plan, that would be a decrease in your premium. Um, but if you're in the uh, Fallon Direct plan, that would be a premium increase of about $63 for members enrolled in, in that plan. So with that in mind, we urge all GIC members who are currently in Fallon plans to actively shop and enroll in new plans during the annual enrollment, rather than being defaulted into a plan that may or may not meet your needs. Um, secondly, I want to note, you know, many members may have also, also have questions about the merger of Tufts Health Plan and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and what it means for your coverage. If you are in one of those plans, I want to assure you that, that this merger will not impact your options for the coming fiscal year. Our Tufts and Harvard Pilgrim products will remain unchanged for the coming uh, fiscal year. We do expect that the new merged company, Point32 Health, um, will respond to the request for responses and, um, and have um, offerings uh, to offer through the next procurement that will kick off um, a little bit later this spring. Next slide. So, um, on to plan design changes. So fiscal year 2023 will be the fifth and final year of our current contracts with the GIC's current plans, uh, with the exception, of course, as I noted, 
Fallon. Um, as a reminder, in general, we'd like to preserve the bulk of changes to our plan designs, to the procurement process, and only make minor adjustments in year-to-year -year plan design. And the, this is especially true for the last year of our current uh, health plan contracts. So um, you'll see uh, here that we are uh, proposing uh, no changes to copays or deductibles for members for the coming year, whether you're in an active plan or a Medicare plan. We are um, also proposing to expand the behavioral health benefit, a small but important change, um, which I want to say a word or two about that is specific to mental health services for children and adolescents. Um, so at the GIC, we have made coverage for behavioral health a top priority, and we acknowledge that the mental health needs of many young people um, are growing dramatically and really need to be addressed. So um, uh, for context here, in, in 2019, uh, the state required most health insurance plans to expand coverage for a range of community and family-based mental health services for children and adolescents, but those rules did not at the time um, apply to GIC plans. Uh, some of these services are already covered by GIC insurance carriers, um, but if the commission approves the staff recommendation, we will essentially make sure that the coverage that's offered to GIC members is identical to the same coverage that uh, the plans offer for most of their uh, members in private insurance plans. Um, so these are services that are traditionally covered only by Mass Health. On to the next slide. So here I um, covered much of what I just said, and, and you'll note at the bottom of the slide here that uh, we have listed the specific services um, in question. Next slide. So again, just a quick reminder that if you have a question uh, throughout the presentation, you can uh, add it in the Zoom Q&A function. Um, and we will address um, some of those questions uh, live in the chat and, and address uh, some of them during the question and answer, answer period following the presentation. And again, if you have a, an inquiry of a personal or specific nature, please use the um, contact form noted in the box below so that we can preserve your privacy. So now that we've reviewed what is upcoming for the annual enrollment this year, I wanna switch gears a little bit and discuss the upcoming health benefit procurement. Uh, so on the next slide, you'll see the GIC is required uh, by law to, pr to procure new contracts um, including health insurance carriers and our pharmacy benefits at least every five years. <clears throat> and as I noted, we are currently in year four of our five-year contract. So we've been working hard to prepare for um, the coming procurement. And here you'll see a high-level timeline for the procurement road ahead. Excuse me. In 2021, we focused on gaining feedback from stakeholders, including our members. I'll have a little more to say about that later, and developing our strategy for the procurement. And now that we're in 2022, we're moving forward with drafting a, a request for responses from our health insurance plans, uh, commonly called an RFR. Uh, but we are still very much engaging with members and stakeholders throughout this process. So we plan to release the RFR in the spring of this year and uh, spend the summer reviewing bids um, and are driving toward a recommendation to our commission for their vote in late calendar year 2022, likely in October. So that's a little overview of the procurement timeline and the steps that we're taking. So as I noted in the previous slide, we've been very busy engaging with members and a variety of other stakeholders as part of this process. And we've identified essentially three main objectives in doing this work. First, 
We want to make sure that we are clearly communicating our timeline on procurement and our priorities um, in the development of our strategy so that everyone is aware of what is underway and where we're focused. Second, through these meetings, we are learning and collecting feedback so that um, we can take all of that into account in drafting our RFR um, that will ultimately lead to the commission vote. And third, we wanna make sure that um, we are building confidence in this process, that it is responsive to stakeholders and resulting in a successful procurement later this year. So as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we would get into a bit more detail about we've, how we've engaged specifically with our members. So this summer, um, we released a survey to our members, which utilize, utilized um, a conjoint analysis. This is a, um, a pretty sophisticated technique used by market researchers to understand what features of a product or a service that consumers value most. Um, as those of you who took the survey may recall, this survey presents participants with often difficult choices and trade-offs that they make in choosing insurance. And this really is by, by design in order to get, um, to really get at what features are most important to you, our members. So those of you who took it really thank you for, um, for taking the time. So on the next slide, you know, we'll note what our primary takeaways were from the survey. And not surprisingly, the findings confirm what much of what we've heard from our members for a while. Uh, members are most sensitive to changes to out-of-pocket costs and deductibles. It is important to note that while the GIC's cost sharing is generally lower than private coverage, most of our members live on modest public salaries and fixed income pensions. So increases in co-pays and deductibles can often have a significant impact on them. Um, we also heard that access to a range of hospitals and doctors is important and that members are generally satisfied with the coverage that you're getting uh, from the GIC. But at the bottom here, you'll know um, below those numbers or underneath those averages, um, we also learned that there's a, a younger set of GIC members that are more interested, um, more interested than the average anyway, in options that might provide a lower premium. Um, so um, so we, it's an important uh, finding as well. So to those again that took the survey, thank you for doing so. It was not a simple survey to take, it was rather complex, but the feedback to us is extremely important um, as we make decisions going forward. So here, um, I wanna talk a little bit about our procurement and describe the areas in which we wanna make progress so that we can live up to that mission I noted at the outset of providing high value, high value benefits to our members. So first, um, call your attention to the left-hand side of the slide, the strategic areas of focus. Not surprisingly, affordability has to be uh, prominently on that list. Across Massachusetts, health insurance premiums are rising faster than the economy overall and certainly faster than wages and pensions of state and municipal uh, public workers. As experts track this data, understand health insurance premiums are rising largely because the prices charged by hospitals and doctors is also rising. So we have the benefit of living in a state with some of the best healthcare in the world. I think we all understand that. But in order for this coverage to be affordable, uh, we must address this long-standing and troublesome trend. In addition, um, can't pick up the newspaper at, uh, on most days and not learn about some truly life-altering breakthrough in prescription drugs. Um, but in many cases, those drugs also come with staggeringly high prices. So we, again, need to find the right balance that provides our members access to these therapies but at a cost that our members and the taxpayers ultimately can afford. Secondly, health equity, COVID-19, 
clearly has laid bare um, inequities in the healthcare system that have been around, been around for a very long time. And we understand that not all communities have the same access to high quality affordable health care. The GIC is committed to doing its part to close these gaps and provide more fairness and equity for all of our members. And then thirdly, behavioral health, as we all know, the need for services for mental health and substance use disorder is rising. And in too many cases, access to these services is not available when it is needed most. I can assure you that the GIC will do all that it can, all that we can, uh, to see that these services are expanded and modernized so that we can close these gaps as well. Um, the center part of the slide, um, what's important to note is that we do not see those strategic areas of focus as unrelated silos. Addressing the rising pressures on affordability is not just a, a focus of our strategy by itself, but we focus on affordability because a failure to do so really has a number of important implications. Um, it hinders us from providing the kind of quality care that we offer. Um, it, it keeps you all as, as our members um, from spending your income on things that are important to you as our premiums rise. And this is especially important for our members on the lower end of the wage scale. But it also um, increases the financial burden on the taxpayer and the state budget, making it more challenging for our elected leaders to invest in areas of, of real need to the Commonwealth. And so you'll see on the right how, the, how our strategic areas of focus and how we see them all as a part of a unified uh, strategy have translated into our guiding principles for the procurement. So thank you for bearing with me for that. Um, lengthy slide, but we do want to make sure that you understand how we're viewing the procurement and what our challenges are. On to the next slide. So um, I, I, I just again note that um, we want to take your feedback, use the Zoom Q&A function for questions that you have. I know we've already received a number of questions, so thank you for that. Um, and again, if you have a, a, an inquiry or question that is personal in nature and includes personal information, please use the form below and we will uh, circle back with you after the session. So at this point, I want to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Paul Murphy. Paul is the Director of Operations at the GIC and someone who has been with the GIC for over three decades. He has a wealth of knowledge and uh, we are very lucky to have him on Team GIC. So Paul, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Matt, and good evening, everyone. Uh, we thought we would add a short presentation on retirement and Medicare. This seems to be one area where GIC gets a lot of questions from members thinking about retirement or what happens when they retire and they go on Medicare. So I'd like to break it into a couple of sections. Uh, first of all, general information. If you are going to retire in the future, uh, we encourage people to notify their agency within 30 to 60 days when they set a retirement date. It's important that you notify your agency because many times if you leave employment and you don't tell your employer you're leaving, they end up terminating you as an employee versus retiring you out of the system, which could, could cause a disruption in the GIC benefits. So we encourage you to notify your HR department when you set a date of retirement so that we can transition you into retirement. The next thing what happens is when we are notified about people that retire from state service, what we do is we need to set you up on a billing. So what that means is that all of your GIC coverage, whether it be the life insurance, health insurance, and dental insurance, will go on to a monthly direct bill for a period of three to four months until we can coordinate with the retirement board to take that deduction. So I can't stress enough, it is important that when you receive a bill from GIC after you leave employment, pay the bill to avoid any disruption in coverage. Many times people think that it's gonna come out on a future pension check, that will be true, but that will be for a current month 
moving forward prospectively. So you've got to pay those bills as GIC sends them to you on a monthly basis. Life insurance. There are basically two policies for state employees. One is called the basic life insurance policy in the amount of $5,000. So you can have just basic life insurance as a state employee. If you have health insurance, you get a $5,000 policy with your health insurance plan. The premium for that is built into your health insurance plan, and it's roughly about $1.59 or $1.27 per month. That will continue if you continue your benefits as a retiree of the Commonwealth. The next area is optional or sometimes called supplemental life insurance. This I encourage people to take a look at the optional life insurance. So if you have additional insurance, which you can purchase as an employee up to eight times your salary, that gets very expensive at retirement. The premium almost doubles when you retire. It's strictly a term insurance. There's no cash surrender value. And after age 70, every five years, the premium increases. So I encourage people to look at that and make any adjustments to the life insurance when you retire. You can decrease that at retirement. You can decrease it any time throughout the year. GIC does send you notifications when the premium is going to change so that you know what the new premium will be as you get older. So I encourage you, if you wanna look at that life insurance, because many people have a surprise billing when they open the bill and they see the cost of life insurance. It's not necessary to keep it. You can cancel it any time throughout the year or after retirement. Next area where we get a lot of questions is dental insurance. And this is one area where members have to do their homework. Uh, the Commonwealth has many different dental plans. There are over 26 union dental plans in the Commonwealth, and GIC also offers a dental and vision plan for members that are not part of a collective bargaining agreement or non-union employees. So what I encourage people to do is look at the plan that you're enrolled in prior to retirement and see what the options are. <laughs> What will happen is if you are enrolled in the GIC dental and vision plan, you have a couple of options when you retire. First, you can take the GIC dental and vision plan through the COBRA. What COBRA will do is bill you at 100% premium for the benefit for a period of 18 months. Now that can be expensive anywhere from 40 to $129 a month. But what happens is you get the exact same benefits you have as an active employee. So there's no change in the benefit. It's just that you have to pay the 100% premium. If you are a union employee and you receive your benefits through the union, your dental and vision, I urge you to contact your union for the details on how to continue that benefit upon retirement. You can continue the benefit under COBRA for 18 months. The third option you have is you do not have to take the COBRA benefits with the GIC plan or with your union plan. You can jump right on the GIC retiree dental plan. Now that plan is about $28 a month for individual and $69 a month for a family plan. The one thing to note here is that the benefits under the GIC dental and vision plan are very different than the benefits you have under your union benefit or the GIC benefits. So you've got to do some comparison. The GIC website has a lot of information to the GIC retiree dental plan. It's also a link to our vendor who administers the plan for both the active and the COBRA and retiree, and that plan is with MetLife. So you've got three options here, just to keep that in mind. You can continue through COBRA with us if you're in our dental plan, through your union, if you're in a union dental plan, or you can jump on retiree dental. The choice is up to you. If you do decide to take the GIC retiree dental plan upon retirement, we will take that premium from your pension check each month. 
One thing to note, if you do enroll in the GIC retiree dental plan, it's important to note that if you decide to cancel that coverage at a later date, there is a lockout. You will never be able to rejoin the plan as a retiree. So once you cancel that plan, then you can't get back in. So I encourage people, if you're not sure if you want to join the plan upon retirement, then don't join and cancel because there is a lockout that you can't get back in. A couple of things to note that if you do decide to join a COBRA plan through your union or through the GIC, at the end of 18 months, you can then join the GIC retiree dental plan. So once the COBRA benefit ends, you can jump right onto the GIC retiree plan. If you decide to take no dental plans, either through the COBRA, your union, or the GIC retirement dental plan upon retirement, you can join that retiree dental plan any annual enrollment period after you retire. So just keep that in mind that you don't have to join, but you can join at a later open enrollment if you choose to do so. Health insurance. This is where it gets kind of tricky for most of our members and how to coordinate with Social Security, Medicare, what happens to their benefits when they reach age 65 or you're under age 65. One area to note is retirees of the Commonwealth currently pay 20% of their monthly premium. So if you were hired for the Commonwealth before 2003, your current health contributions are at 20%. If you were hired from the Commonwealth after July 1st, 2003, you currently pay 25%. What happens is when you retire, you pay 20%. So those people before 2003 will continue to pay the 20% premium, but those that retire after or hired the Commonwealth after 2003 get to continue their benefit from 25%, they get a reduction down to 20% for their health insurance. I'm going to kind of talk through Medicare and health insurance right now. So what I want to do is do a couple of scenarios and, you know, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A section. We'll be happy to answer them. Or as Matt said, you can direct them to our online contact form if you have any questions after this. So if you are under age 65, when you retire, you can remain in your existing GIC health plan. So you and your family can stay in that plan if you are under age 65 upon retirement. At retirement, one thing to note is that you can also change plans when you retire. So retirement is a qualifying event for you to change your health plan on the day you retire. Many people say to us, do I have to change it during the annual enrollment before I retire because I want to change to a different plan? No, you can change upon retirement. It's a qualifying event to change your health plan at retirement. Thereafter, as a retiree, you will be able to change your health plan during every annual enrollment period. Age 65. If you are over age 65 upon retirement, under state law, you are required to enroll in Medicare. So both you and any family member over age 65, if you want to continue your health insurance, we encourage you to apply to Medicare for your benefits. It's a state law that if you're eligible for Medicare, you must join a Medicare supplemental plan with GIC. If you do not enroll in Medicare upon retirement, if you're 65 or older, then GIC will end your benefit at retirement. Medicare has two parts. There's Medicare Part A, which is referred to many times as hospital insurance. The monthly premium for that is free. Medicare does not charge you for the Medicare Part A premium. Medicare Part B has a premium $170 a month for that, and that is often referred to as doctor's insurance. So when you're approaching age 65 or, or older than 65, we encourage people to go online with Medicare and apply for your Medicare benefits. If you are eligible for Medicare Part A and Part B, then you are allowed to pick one of the GIC's supplemental Medicare plans. So 
So all of the plans that GIC offers, whether it be Unicare, Tufts, et cetera, we all have a supplemental plan because what happens when you retire and become Medicare eligible, Medicare becomes a primary payer. So the state insurance becomes the secondary payer. So you can pick any Medicare plan that the GIC offers when you become Medicare eligible. And we encourage you to take a look at our benefit decision guide that comes out every year or on our website with any questions you may have about the Medicare supplemental plans. Many of the plans are offered at a reduced premium because Medicare becomes the primary payer. So the GIC is giving you a Medicare plan at a lower cost. Your co-pays, deductibles also are reduced by joining one of our Medicare plans and the annual deductible of 500 for individual and 1,000 for family goes away when you join the GIC Medicare supplemental plans. If you're thinking or you have questions about Medicare also has a Medicare Part D product, which is often referred to a prescription drug plan. You do not need to join a Medicare Part D plan with Social Security. All of GIC's Medicare plans have a prescription drug benefit. So when you retire and go on Medicare, that vendor is currently CVS Silver Script. So there is no need to join a Medicare Part D plan when you become Medicare eligible. And one thing to note that many people say that they've worked for the state government or municipality all of their life. And what happens is they don't think they're eligible for Medicare Part A and Part B. Everyone needs to apply for Medicare upon age 65 or when they retire to see if they are eligible. If you are not eligible for Medicare when you retire, then you are allowed to keep the non-Medicare plan that the GIC currently offers. You can stay in the health plan you have and you don't have to join a Medicare supplemental plan. So I know there's a lot of information that we've sort of touched here, but keep in mind the areas, life insurance, dental, and Medicare. GIC also sends you a letter three months before your 65th birthday, asking you and telling you what you need to do upon retirement or when you become Medicare eligible. So we do send you a letter with instructions on all the steps you need to take and how to enroll in a Medicare plan. Like I said before, there's a lot of information about turning age 65 on our website. We also have a video and we also have a section on our website about retirement. So keep in mind, annual enrollment does apply to you as a retiree. Then we also allow you to change plans and you have every annual enrollment in which you can change plans as a retiree, enroll in a plan or even enroll in the dental plan during any annual enrollment. So. I know it's a lot of information in a short period of time, but I just wanted to touch some areas that, you know, we get a lot of questions. And on that note, I think I can turn it back over to Matt. Great, thank you, Paul. <clears throat> um, we wanted to spend a fair amount of time on that just because as Paul noted, this is an area um, around retiree questions where we get lots of inquiries. So. Um, so thank you for, for that, Paul. And so at this point, um, we're gonna move to the final uh, element here. I, I do wanna note that um, the GIC uh, member uh, benefit portal is something that we've spent a, a, a significant amount of time, of time on recently. And it's an excellent resource uh, for our members uh, just recently launched where our members can log on uh, view your current benefits, um, uh, make changes that in the past you would have had to fill out a form and mail to the GIC. You can do them self-service um, there. We also encourage uh, members to use this um, um, you know, throughout the year. And so there's, uh, um, it's a it's a great resource, and for those who want to use it, you can register. You you should all have received um, a registration um, email uh, to tell you a little bit about this. So I just wanted to take the opportunity to uh, plug the member portal here.
And just to close with a, a reminder of our annual enrollment period, as I mentioned earlier, verbally, um, it will open on April the 6th and close on May the 4th. This is usually when we do um, uh, uh, the annual enrollment period, so it should be no surprise to anyone. So here, uh, we'll just close before we uh, address a few questions that have come up that, that we think would be um, relevant to everyone and that you may wanna hear uh, from, from me and my team on. Just wanted to note a few helpful resources for you, um, uh, the contact information and websites for each of our uh, vendors for all of the benefits that we provide. Um, information on all of these um, partners is also available on on the GIC website. So that's mass.gov slash GIC. And I think we're gonna leave that up and I'll turn it over to Erica to uh, see what questions we may have heard that we wanna address verbally. Great, thanks Matt. Um, so let me just pull our questions here. So one of the first questions that we got, um, we did answer it live. Um, in the chat, but thought it would, would be a good um, question to answer for everyone. And that is how would GIC coverage work uh, if you moved out of Massachusetts? I see Donna answered that question in the chat. Um, so if either Paul or Donna would like to answer that uh, live for the benefit of everyone, that would be great. I can take that, Erica. Uh, as Donna noted in the Q and A. When you move out of the Commonwealth, or if you move out of a health plan service area, that is a qualifying event, and you are allowed to change to a new plan when you move. GIC would just ask that you give us proof of the new residency, and pick your new plan and notify us, and we can move you into that new plan. So if you move out of the Commonwealth, you can enroll in any of the plans, such as the Unicare Basic Plan, which is a nationwide plan or if you move out of a local HMO product like Health New England and you move to the Boston area, you can pick a health plan that's in the Boston area if you move out of like the Health New England service area. So we do give you the option. You have 60 days from the time you move to notify us and we'll change you to your new health plan to continue your benefits. Thank you, Paul. Um, another question we have is, uh, is it possible to change from a single plan to a family plan at any time? I think, Paul, this is, again, one for you. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, changing from an individual to a family plan, if you have a qualifying event, such as birth of a child or marriage, GIC does allow you to change to a family plan. Again, it's a qualifying event, and you have 60 days from the birth of a child or marriage to change to a family plan. Thereafter, if you don't do it within the 60 days, you can do it during any of our annual enrollment periods. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, scroll, we're getting a lot coming in now. So um, one question we received, what are options of a vision plan, of a retiree vision plan excluding COBRA? And Paul, I know you touched on this a little bit, but if you could um, just review it. Correct, as in leaving COBRA out on the vision, because if you continue through COBRA, you get the vision benefit that you had while you were working. What the GIC does offer is a retiree discount plan for the vision. It's through Davis Vision, and it's strictly a discount plan. It is available to all retirees that have GIC coverage. There's no enrollment, it's free of charge, and every retiree is eligible to participate in the discount plan. Your family members are also eligible to participate in the vision discount plan if the family members are enrolled in your health insurance plan. So that's one caveat that in order for your family to be eligible for the discount plan, they must be enrolled in your health plan. But all retirees with GIC coverage are eligible for the vision plan, no enrollment, no monthly fee, it's strictly a discount plan. And you'll find the link to the Davis Vision discount plan on our website for more information. Thank you. 
Um, another question for you, Paul, I think this is gonna be a theme. Uh, when should we expect the updated benefit decision guides to be available? The benefit decision guides will most likely be available uh, to retirees. We mail them out at the end of March, and then we'll be putting the online versions right before annual enrollment begins on April 6th. So I'd say right around the end of March or the beginning of April, they will be up on the website and mailed to retirees' homes. Great, thank you. Um, so we have another question here. Um, why isn't there a high deductible, low premium plan offered that could perhaps be applicable to people who anticipate using less healthcare services? I see that Cameron answered um, in the Q&A function itself. Um, so I think um, Matt might wanna take a, an initial pass at this and then we can follow up with Cameron. Yeah, thank you, Erica. So I, I, noted, in, I noted that question and then as, as, as uh, embedded in a separate question was whether we could offer a zero deductible um, plan as an option. And I would say that, you know, these are all questions that um, we are asking ourselves um, as part of the procurement process. What we wanna be able to do is to offer meaningful choice to our members, uh, depending on their unique circumstance. Um, those are two potential options for us to consider. Um, I would say they both have pluses and minuses, right? Um, so um, I, I guess I want to assure those who have posed those questions that um, these are the sorts of options that we are evaluating uh, and will consider through the procurement process. Cameron, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I don't. I don't have anything else to add. You know, we Matt's put it uh, very well. You know, it's something we'd love to see greater differentiation in our offerings, and hopefully that can be a result of this upcoming procurement. Yeah, and I would say, you know, as it relates to high deductible health plans, you know, we operate as a state agency under, you know, a a statutory uh, uh, authorization in state law about uh, services that we can offer and may not offer. Um, some of the options that have been suggested would require us to actually change that statute. So, you know, like I said, there are pros and cons to each. There are reasons why some of them are more difficult to contemplate than others. And we um, take all of those different considerations into account as we put together our plan. Matt, uh, we got another question. Um, will there ever be a plus one plan? Yeah, it's a great question. So we have, um, and, and it's one that we've wrestled with quite a bit uh, since I got here, but also before I got here. Um, so we offer, a, we offer an individual plan and we offer a family plan. So what this question is about, is there a different plan type that we could offer that is the individual plus one other person. Um, so as we evaluate that sort of an option, um, we look at a lot of the GIC data to understand what the impact of that sort of a change would be. Um, and as with anything of this nature in insurance, um, it could benefit certain individuals with lower premium, but it holds the risk also of increasing premium um, in this case, for those who are in a family plan. So, um, you know, it's a complex set of trade-offs that we have to evaluate. Um, I can assure the person who's asked this that it's something that we are, um, you know, we, we do continue to evaluate. Thanks, Matt. Um, so I have a question here. How much lead time is necessary to get set up uh, as a retiree with the GIC? And I'll, I'll direct this one over to Paul, of course. Well, there's a couple of things. If you're currently insured with GIC as an active employee and you're going to retire, as I stated in the presentation, at least 30 to 60 days before you retire, you talk to your HR department, fill out the necessary paperwork, and they will notify GIC and will transition you into retirement. 
If you're not enrolled with GIC benefit, but you are planning to retire, retirement is a qualifying event for you to enroll. So at that time, same time frame, 30 to 60 days prior to retirement, you can contact our office and we'll give you the information you need to send to us to enroll. Great, thank you, Paul. Um, let's see, I, I see that there are other answers being typed as, as I speak right now in our uh, Q&A section here. Um, but I did want to uh, check in with Cameron who noted that there were a couple of retiree specific questions uh, that he wanted to pose. Uh, so Cameron, I will turn it over to you uh, if you have a moment to ask those. Uh, sure, actually I was uh, going to ask for Paul's assistance on one in particular. Um, we had a question uh, that said, what if I want to join the GIC dental plan, but opted out of the pension plan? How do I pay or get billed? To be eligible for GIC benefits upon retirement, you have to be collecting and receiving a monthly pension benefit. If you are not eligible to collect a pension through a public retirement system, you are not eligible for GIC benefits. Okay. And that was under the assumption that that plan, since they mentioned pension plans, I assumed that was specific to retirees, but then I realized that perhaps this is someone who somehow doesn't participate in a pension plan and is an active employee, um, in which case that determines whether or not you have dental coverage available through a collective bargaining agreement, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that was the only one I had. I think we're doing a fairly good job of keeping up with the Q and A's otherwise. Great. Um, I do have one here. Um, this individual is asking if you were on your spouse's insurance and you retired, can you then enroll in the GIC and add your spouse? If you are on your spouse's insurance and you retire from the Commonwealth, your retirement is a qualifying event for you to enroll. So you can join at retirement or any annual enrollment thereafter. And the second part is, um, could this individual then add the spouse? Yes. Yes, okay, great. GIC will require a copy of a marriage certificate, but yes, you can enroll your spouse or any eligible dependent under age 26. Okay, great. Um, right, so the remainder of some of the questions that we're getting um, are looking like they're pretty um, specific and personal in nature. Um, so I will direct those folks to um, our contact form. Um, but I believe we're right at time here. Um, and I, I think that's all we've got. So I'll turn it back over to Matt. Terrific. Well, I wanna thank my team um, uh, for assisting both in the uh, presentation and in the Q and A. Um, and I wanna thank all of you who have um, joined us for the information session. Um, we will have two additional sessions, uh, one tomorrow uh, midday, another one Thursday morning. So please, um, you know, view our website for more information about those. I will also direct members' attention to uh, the website uh, for um, any information that they're looking to get about COVID-19 rapid tests, something that has been um, a recent hot topic and we've been spending a fair amount of time on. So there's a, there's a, a wealth of resources for you at, um, at at our website noted here on this page, mass.gov slash GIC. Um, and, you know, stay in touch with us. Um, uh, we have a, a, a really hardworking, dedicated and talented team of individuals um, in the operations unit, Paul, Paul's team and, and Donna's team um, who are 
um, eager to help you understand uh, the myriad questions that arise as you consider your benefits. Um, so please feel free to reach out to us um, at any time. But also just thank you so much for participating.